We're continuing our series on judgment. The last time we looked at if God were to judge us or what was his standard for us individually, it would be that light had come. We would prefer darkness rather than light. And so he judges us on the line that the light comes. And if you didn't obey it, judgment came. So we're going to look at tonight the standard that he uses to judge the heathen. Remember now he going to have a judgment day. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. This is to inform us about what's going to take place because the rapture is going to take place and we won't be here. You never talk to a person and minister to them about if you don't receive Jesus, you're going to hell. Don't ever say that. You lift up the name of Jesus and the person gets the opportunity to accept him. You don't browbeat people. Everybody know they need to get their spiritual life straight. And basically, you want to encourage them in the Lord. That's when you ministering to people outside the church. Okay, come with me to the second psalm. The first thing to ask in regard to the standard of God's judgment for the heathen is, what about the people who have never heard of Jesus Christ, may never hear of him? How are they to be judged? You thought that one time Jimmy Swaggart went from one end of the earth to the other end. So God's standard is that for people that are heathens, first off, we need to define what a heathen is. When the second psalm was written, Jesus Christ had not gone to Calvary's cross. So the heathens would be the Gentiles and those Gentile nations. Okay, So look at Psalms 2, because God's standard is that the light they have, he going to judge them by the light that they have, not the light they have never had or could not get. He can't judge them the same way he judged us or the church, because they don't know Jesus, never heard of him. Psalms 2, why do the heathen rage? Remember now, the heathen is the Gentiles, the nation. The Gentiles did not come into the covenant until after Jesus was resurrected. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cut away their cards from us. What they're saying, we will not submit to him or his. So we go break their bands He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. This is speaking of the birth and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me. Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. Speaking of his incarnation, his ministry. Then here's the promise. He says, ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. Now when he said for he go give him for their inheritance, he's speaking about them being what? Converted. The heathen is going to be converted. He ain't going to stay a heathen forever. And the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. He's talking about his kingship over the whole earth. Not just over Jerusalem and Judah. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, there are four raging classes. Verse 1, you have the heathen. You have the people. These are the Jews. In verse 2, You got the kings of the earth. These are Gentile rulers. In verse 2, you also have the rulers. These are Jewish leaders. So see, it's almost like a political thing that's wrapped in it, involved in it too. The Jewish people was always plotting against God. And the kings of the earth set themselves against the Lord and his anointed. And the rulers... The Jewish leader, they took counsel together against him. And the other thing that they did, when they said, let us break their bands, they were encouraging themselves to get rid of God and the Messiah. Now, over in Psalms 22, look at verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. 
and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before him. 22 and 28, for the kingdom is the Lord and he is governor among the nations. Come with me to Matthew's 25th chapter. The standard of God's judgment for the heathens or the Gentiles. This was before Jesus Christ. Psalms 2 was before Jesus Christ went to the cross. So we're going to look at some things in the New Testament because he said until this gospel be preached into all the earth. Each month I take a country or I look on a map and pick out me a little city and I pray for that place. I'm praying for Chile. You know, ask the Holy Spirit to pray for other peoples in other parts of the world. The United States have heard enough gospel to save China, if that's how they say it. So you want to get in the habit of praying for other believers in other countries. Okay, let's start in verse 31. It says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory. When is he going to come in his glory? When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. He is speaking about immediately after the tribulation. See, we won't be here. Immediately after the tribulation, the rapture already been took place. Now, he said, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Well, who is his glory? His saints. What do we be coming back for? When we come back with him, what we be coming back for? The fight. <laughs> fight the battle arm again. Yeah. He ain't going to leave his glory behind. Okay, look at Matthew 24, 29. This is the time of his second coming. See, the rapture is one thing. That's when he comes and he receives us to himself. The second advent is his second coming. The first advent was his incarnation. When he came incarnated into a flesh, bone, blood body. His second coming is when he come back to fight. His second coming. This is for he set up his millennial kingdom reign. The things in the spirit realm happen like some things can happen, coincide with each other. But for teaching purposes, we have to kind of like separate them. Verse 24 and 29 says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. What days? The great tribulation. Shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see with their physical eyes the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Coming back to fight and to judge this earth realm. 25 and 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. For what purpose? To judge the living nations? He's coming to judge. And before him or in his presence shall be gathered all nations. This is not the wicked dead. These people are alive. And he shall separate them one from another. Remember not the nations. Jesus has not gone to the cross, so these are Gentile nations. These are heathens. And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Now remember now the nations, the sheep are the true believers. In this instance, he's talking about Israel, believe it or not. The goats... If we would say concerning the church, it would be sinners. The sheep would be righteous believers. But in concerning Israel, remember not God is going to deal with the church as he dealt with the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, the old covenant and his dealings with Israel actually shows us how he going to deal with us in the future. Because what? You read the Old Testament, feel like it's the same thing still going on. It hadn't changed. Same thing. So this is a judgment of living people. All right. Then he says in verse 34, verse 34 is a promise. He said, then shall the king say to them on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Remember now, he's talking to those who are the call according to his purpose in the New Testament 
right here, he is speaking to the nation of Israel according to the election. Remember now, how did God start? He started with one person. Who? Abraham. Abraham went to Egypt, all 69, 72, how many of them? And that was the who? The house of who? That was Abraham house, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So theoretically, that was the see. Ishmael comes in some time ago. They become the what? The children of the flesh. Take it over to the New Testament. Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is the judgment of who is going to be determined to go into the kingdom. You got to look at it like this. Jesus hadn't died yet. Gentiles hadn't come in. He's speaking of this judgment as a promise to determine who will inherit the kingdom. All right. Now we are going to go to Romans 8 and 17. We're going to go in the New Testament. Because see, Jesus always declaring stuff from the beginning. So you'll know how it's going to be in the end. So come with me to Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs. If you are a child of God, you are heir of God. And you join heir with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, you're going to identify with his death, burial, and resurrection, that we may be also glorified. See, this is heirship. Now, as far as I'm concerned, like I said, if you name the name of Christ, and let's say you walk in perpendicular to that, as far as I'm concerned, I see with the eye of faith that you're still an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I refuse to look at it any other way because he's a righteous judge. If he loved us when we was dead in sin, and he first loved us before we loved him, and he ain't going to leave us nor forsake us, and we just find out that the heathen nations are going to be converted, don't ever play anybody's spirituality down, even though they may not be conducting themselves as a Christian. The just shall live by what? Faith. You got to teach yourself to see like Jesus see. How does he see us? How does the Father see us? Through the blood of Jesus. How are you looking at other people? You got to train yourself like that. If you don't, who you going to mess up? Yourself. Like I said the other day, the most difficult task for the Holy Spirit is to cause us not to look at things personal or take things personal, but look at them like the words say look at them. Do like the words say do. Come with me to Galatians 5, 19. But now the works of the flesh are manifested. I'm going to tell you they made visible. Which are these? He talking to Christian people now. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, no restraints, idolatry, witchcraft, hatreds, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envyings, murders. You don't have to shoot nobody or kill them. Say he who hated his brother is a murderer. Drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before as I have also told you in times past. That they which do such things shall what? Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you die, you will go to heaven. But who wants to go like this to be judged before Jesus Christ? Why you want to go to the judgment seat of Christ and he done list these things and told you that if you do them, you won't have no inheritance. You won't be an heir. You won't be a joint heir with Christ. Why? Don't none of this identify with Christ. All right. First Corinthians six chapter. I think most Christians don't understand that judgment day will come. They don't live like the time has come. They live like they've been living. First Corinthians six, nine. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminates. What are effeminates? Homosexuality, lesbianism. And people want you to accept them when it's an abomination to God. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Neither thieves, uh uh-uh, God robbers, those that don't pay their tithes, nor covetous. Now, why does he say nor covetous? What is covetous as? Witchcraft and what else? 
idolatry because it's involved the love of money. Now, drunkards, not only with strong drink, but drunk with the world and its system, pride of life, lust of the eyes, nor revilers, nor extortioners, like preachers getting in the pulpit, extort money out of the church. Those are extortioners. Shall they shall what? Shall inherit the kingdom of God. And search was some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You take your life and you use this as a checklist. Lord, you know I love you, and if I got anything like this in me and I'm unaware of it, you search my heart, you know. I want you to bring it up because I am an heir, an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. This is your vocation. Being a Christian is a business. It is a vocation. It is the Father's business. Let's go back to Matthew's 25th, 34th verse. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We all know what 1 Corinthians 2 and 9 says about the spirit of man, those things that God has prepared for us, you ain't heard about them. For them that love him. Your eyes hadn't seen them and you ain't heard about them. That's 1 Corinthians 2 and 9. And the thing about it, these people that he's talking to are actually the call according to his purpose. Verse 35. For I was a hungered and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. You took me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee, a thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? You heard all that, huh? Christians do not always appear to believe that they are dealing with Christ himself when they are dealing with his disciples. See, when I deal with any of y'all, how would Christ handle it? Not how it was supposed to be handled. I deal with y'all according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I do that, I don't have any problems with personal things. Because the only reason why I got it is God gave it to me. So what you going to do with what he gives you? You going to do what he tell you to do and ain't going to look back or nothing. I wrote a prayer down here. I said, Lord Jesus, give us the power to discern your spirit, your life. Don't care how small in every one of your disciples are his. Don't care what you think, how small they look. Don't care what they did. Discern the life of Christ in them. And you treat them as if they were Christ. And he'll take care of the rest. Who are you going to look at? You. How is she handling that? How is he handling that? Help us to know how we may honor you in our treatment to each other. So you honor Christ depending on how you treat somebody else. And in verse 40, he said, and the king, capital K, and the king shall answer and say unto them, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Now, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of my brethren. What about those that are his brethren? Jesus' brethren was those also according to the what? Flesh. You don't want to get spiritual, so spiritual you ain't no earthly good. If you do that, you can't enjoy your salvation. You can't be a vessel rightly for the Lord Jesus Christ to manifest himself through you for somebody else. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about when I say this. Matthew's the 10th chapter. Remember now, if you've done it to the least of one of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. You'll get the gist of it. Look what he said in 10 and 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. So you see, he's basically speaking about Israel in that whole scenario I'm just going back into the New Testament to show us how it is. God's laws and rules don't change. If you be Christ, then are you who? Abraham sees and heirs according to the promise. So we want the promises, but we don't want the curses. 
and into any city of the Sumerians enter ye not. But rather, listen to what he said. Now we're talking about him according to the flesh. He says, but rather, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, ain't that some sheep? Lost sheep. They his sheep, but they lost. But he's talking about the house of Israel. All right, let's go to John 1 and 11. You'll see clear as I get to it. John, first chapter, look at 11 verse. According to the flesh, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Don't go to the Gentiles, don't even go to the Samaritans, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came into his own, and his own didn't receive him. One more scripture verse, Romans 9 and 5. We lived in Romans 9 chapter. At least I did. Paul said in verse 9 and 3, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Remember what Jesus said? If you've done it to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. The Gentiles hadn't come in yet. Now look at verse 5. Well, we can read all this. For I could wish that myself were cursed or cut off from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertained the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. So when Jesus said back then, over there in Luke 25, if you've done it to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. And you can use that in the instance of Israel, okay? You did it to me, implying the very intimate union existing between Christ and all true believers, so that whatever is done to one of them, whether good or bad, he considers it as done to himself. Now, in the case of Israel, with Abraham and that whole what I just read, I will bless those that what? And do what? Curse those that curse you. That's how he go judge the nations according to what they did to Israel. If you done it to the least of them, my brethren, you done it to me. Well, how did you treat Israel? That's a spiritual law. God is going to fulfill the Abraham covenant because of the Jews. He fulfills that covenant. Remember what he told Abraham in Genesis 12? Now the Lord has said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you. And curse him that cursed you. And in you, in thee shall all, all families, as all nations, as everybody of the earth be blessed. In him, in order for the people in the New Testament to partake of Abraham's blessing, they got to be in Christ. They just can't come back and get this. They have to be in Christ. And so when we send our tithes to Israel, we're being blessed. Okay, let's go back to Matthew 25. Let's get to them people that's on the left. These are promises that he going to keep. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand. Now he's speaking to the wicked dead. This don't have nothing to do with Christians who ain't doing stuff right. You know why? Because he said, depart from me. You cursed into eternal or everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This is the wicked dead. And you'll find out about the lake of fire over there in Revelation 20, chapter 10 to 15. So when it comes to the nations, they're going to be judged on how they handle Israel. That's right. And then in verse 42, he said, For I was a hunger, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger. You took me not in naked, and you clothed me not. See, when it gets down to it, in verse 45, he answers them saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to the one of the least of these, whether it's his disciple or whether it's the nation of Israel. He says what? You did it not to me. And these, here's the promise, these shall go 
away into eternal punishment. That's eternal suffering in hell for the duration, eternity, throughout all eternity, but the righteous into life eternal. Let's go to Romans, the second chapter. Remember now, God's standard for the heathen, the light they have, not the light they have never had or could not get. You say, you think everybody heard about Jesus Christ. Everybody knew about the gospel. So then what would God judge these people by? We're going to find out over here in Romans. What would you think God would judge them people by? Somebody say something? Commandments? Well, that means that they would have their commandments in place. They don't know Jesus, never heard of him. How would he judge them? He can't judge them on if they never heard of him. What light he going to judge them? See, the thing is this, never having had a chance to hear about it. So you know everybody in America don't know about Jesus because this is the land of opportunity. So they have places where they have not had the chance or have never heard of his name being called. Conscience is the standard by which men and women are to be judged until they have been brought into contact with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason why when a preacher go preach to a heathen, he can't say, you don't have Jesus, therefore you lost and you're going to hell. Who is Jesus? You can't browbeat people. You have to present Jesus. The gospel is the good news. Why you go <laughs> tell somebody lost and going to hell? Always remember when you minister in the gospel, the gospel is the good news. Man, I can tell you how to get out of this problem. You might not like it. How? Jesus. And then you start from the time when he was incarnated. Very God. And when he came into the earth realm. All you got to do is minister Jesus and let the Holy Ghost do his job. Look at 2 and 11. He says, for there is no respect of persons with God. You know what that means? God do not accept the person's face. He do not accept you at face value. Or oh, we got the rich family over here and the destitute family over here. Most people go with the who? The rich and the powerful and the poor man alone. God don't do that. No respects a person. He does not receive face. He doesn't accept face. He goes where? To the heart. Thank God he goes to the heart. And the reason why he said that was because he put the Jew. See, look at verse 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man, upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Of the Jew first. Why the Jew first? Because he going to be held in responsibility. Look at all that stuff that was given to him in Romans 9. Everything came to the Jew. The Jew had the privilege and the right. They had God first. The Gentiles just came in on it. So that's why it says the Jew first. They had a greater advantage above the Gentile. But God told them, no, if you do evil, don't care whether you're a Jew or Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. He's just telling you, you had the responsibility. Now the Gentiles will come in. If you work good, good. If you work bad, it's going to be bad for you. I don't care whether you're Jew, Gentile. I have no respects of person. Verse 12. For as many as have sinned. This is what it said. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. Speaking generally, you're a heathen. You don't have no law. But when God comes in the picture concerning anybody, it's sin. If you sin, whether you got the law, and the next one said, as many as have sinned in the law. So whether you without the law or whether you in the law, this is God. You will come under condemnation. You will come under judge. You know, the Jews go to the synagogue, hear the law. They hear the law read. Birthrights, privileges. And so they kind of threw that at Paul. Paul said, verse 13, for not the hearers, of the law are righteous or justified in the presence of God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So he was letting them know the hearer means that they were receiving it. Like you're receiving instruction right now. You're hearing the word of God right now. This is hearing as far as instruction. For you to hear and don't do, you deceive your own self. So he was saying, oh, I go to, I go to church. I hear the preacher. I don't miss no church. That ain't going to fly with God. The doing is what justifies you. Are you doing means to obey. You got to obey the word of God. To know to do and don't do is sin. Whether it's with the law or without the law, sin is sin. Verse 14, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, heathens, don't have laws. But yes, they do. They got laws. They have their own type of morality, but they have laws. But listen to what this said. 
But when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature, talking about their conscience, the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Remember now, the Gentiles ain't had no covenant. They ain't had no Mosaic law. But they had a law, or they heard about certain things concerning the law, or God put things in one's conscience, the light of life, given to who? Men. When? When they were born. You born with life, you born with God in you. Don't care who you are. And the life was the light of men, that the light lighted every man that came into the world. Don't care who you were. Verse 13 to verse 15 is parenthetical. It's in parentheses. So we'll take care of that. But when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these not having the law, because the law wasn't given to the Gentiles, are a law unto themselves. What does this law show? It shows the work of the law written in their heart. If it's written in their heart, you go see the law show up in the conduct. You always see the word of God show up in a person's conduct, in his manner of life, the way he speaks, the way he handles other people. This is what God look at. We show the work of the law written in their heart, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts or their reasoning does what? Bear witness to the existence of a law that's in them. See, the law is in them, in their conscience. It's not the Mosaic law. It's something that is of a moral nature as how to treat people. And this is the reason why. It says, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. Well, if you've got a system set up where I can accuse you, you can defend yourself. That's a recognition of some kind of law. And see, this is what God will judge them on. Their standards in their society and how they conduct themselves. So if you read verse 12 and skip 13, 14, and 15 and go to 16. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. In the day when God shall judge the hidden things, the secret of men, the hidden things. See, they had a law that was written in their heart. And you know what's written in a person's heart by the way he acts or the way he talks, or his reasoning as he think it in his heart. And so it says, in that day when God shall judge the secret of men, the secret of men are hidden things, by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Not false teaching, not what you think, but according to the good news gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is how you want to live your life. In Second Thessalonians, you'll have to turn that, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. See, judgment comes on that line. Light come, truth come, and you don't believe the truth? Why? Light come, and you had pleasure in darkness. Then he that believe it on him is not condemned. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to be judged. But he that believe it not is condemned when? Already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3, 18. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. What? Even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? He that believeth that Jesus is the Christ. Amen.